Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. December 19th, 2017. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. And the Southern girls with the way they talk. It is The Savage Nation. We are talking about, oh, let's hear the next refrain. Just for a minute, bring me back to our reality here. Before I thought about politics. Anyway, convertibles, Florida, sun. We'll come back to the topics that I introduced in the last hour in a few minutes. Right now, we shift to the media and the changing media landscape. And uh, it is changing rapidly, believe me, with conglomeration, mergers and acquisitions. The media landscape in 2018 will not be the same as it is now. And a man who is very much involved in that media landscape that is changing is... Chris Ruddy of Newsmax, a good friend of mine. Chris, welcome to the Savage Nation. Always great to be on with you, Michael. Do you, con- you consider it an honor for me to say you're a friend of mine, or you're a little leery of it? Um. Oh, okay, that's your answer. I got it. It'll just, it'll just be our secret, all right? We won't let anyone know. <laughs> well, Chris, you're in the news a lot. I'm very proud. I'm very proud. You and I were friends for a long time, even before you uh, went national on your radio show. I was at Newsmax in the year 2000 as a local host during, if you could believe it, the Clinton election. Would you believe that? Oh, no, no. That was the Gore election. I think it was Gore. Gore. Right. And we even go back to our North Beach days, hitting those bars and Italian restaurants. Well, let's leave that to... I didn't even know you lived out here, but okay. I I, kind of blacked that out. So, (laughs) so Chris, you're right in the heart of it all. You, You are a regular... At the president's table, is that right? Well, I wouldn't put it that way, but I'm, I'm certainly been a friend of the president's and a supporter of his for many years, and um, I, um, I have a lot of respect for him, and I think he's doing a tremendous job that he's not getting the credit for his accomplishments. Well, the latest poll I ran, people rated him as an A minus, so we know the, the the headwaters he's run into. But what are you, looking ahead to 2018, Chris, what's happening in the media that's going to change? Well, this is really interesting. President Trump ran against the consolidation of media power. Remember, that was a line he used. And, of course, he was complaining about CNN merging with AT&T. And that issue has been raised with the uh, Justice Department um, in their new mega merger. But the real big bad deal that's going on, I think is a great danger, is the Sinclair Tribune merger, which is going to combine the Sinclair TV stations with the Tribune TV stations, which are in big cities like Los Angeles, Chicago, Channel 11 in New York. And a lot of people like this initially because they know Sinclair is conservative or somewhat conservative. Mm -hmm. And I think Sinclair is good guys, but the president's FCC under a guy named Ajit Pai, is allowing Sinclair and Tribune to own a network that's going to reach 72% of U.S. homes. Now, this is a earthquake in the media landscape. It's going to be really big trouble and danger for conservatives and Republicans in the years ahead. And the reason is, Michael, it takes people just like 60 seconds to understand this, Reagan put in, in 1985, an ownership cap on the big networks like NBC and CBS that Uh own local TV stations that reach more than 25% of the United States. Because Reagan knew if NBC and CBS were controlling your local news, Republicans and conservatives would not get a fair shake. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump himself told me the reason he won the election was that the national news didn't control all these local news stations. But his own FCC is now opening the door 
by approving this merger um, that will allow NBC and CBS to buy up your local news station. And so, so but you, you must have raised this with the president. What has he said to you? Well, he doesn't, he's not heard a lot about it, interestingly enough. And, you know, the president's got so many things on his plate. He's been dealing mm. with the tax thing, the health care bill, Congress, and North Korea. So I know everybody thinks, oh, you just mentioned it to the president, he'll handle it. But he's got a lot on his plate. I have raised the issue with him. I've been raising it with members of Congress. Mike Reagan has launched a national a um, uh, uh, petition to protect his father's ownership cap. If you go to the website, stopthefccplan.com, stopthefccplan.com, you'll see it's all laid out in the petition. Well, tell us about Newsmax, though. Obviously, Chris, this is not in the interest of your expansion, and I understand that. Everyone has to look out for themselves. You're expanding rapidly with Newsmax TV. Uh, isn't it true that you are, are doing something with Comcast? Well, this rule, this, this would not impact Newsmax at all, what's going on with the FCC, because we're not in broadcasting stations. Mm. Um, we are currently on uh, cable systems. We're on Newsmax TV is now in 50 million cable homes, Michael. We're on Direct wow. TV. We're on Dish. We're on Uverse. We're on Fios. We're hoping to get on Comcast and Spectrum Charter and cable vision we're working on that we don't have any news yet obviously anybody out there that listens uh, to your show that wants newsmax tv that's in 50 million homes call your local cable operator on the customer service line tell them you want newsmax tv and getting the stories i mean we're covering so much news that uh, even fox doesn't cover um and it's really important i think that there be more conservative voices and that's why we've been growing so fast you know, it's interesting, Chris. If I go to your website, Newsmax.com, which I've gone on since the beginning of my radio show, you're one of the early ones in the business. I'm now writing columns for you two, three times a week under the insiders on the right panel. It says, Michael Savage, the Savage Minute, should there be a statute of limitations for sexual harassment claims? That's one example of articles I'm doing for you. And I really enjoy the exposure on Newsmax. I'd like to help you in your, you know, in your expansion any way I can, Chris. But getting back to the, um, the bigger issue, and the one I think the listeners would be like to hear more about, which is, look, you are a very social guy. I know that for 20 years now. You like to go to dinners. You create dinners. You had me to Mar-a-Lago last February when I met the president. That was like a high point in my life. And uh, w what is going on socially now down in Florida at Mar-a-Lago? What is it like, Chris? Well, this whole area of South Florida has people from New York and Washington and the Northeast and all over the country in the world. People come in here. Newsmax just happens to be based in Boca and my geography. I've lived down here for over tw almost 20 years now and I've gotten to know the president a, a very significant portion of that time uh, and I'm a member of his club there. Um, so it's, it's a very active time. It's people are coming together. A lot on the weekends are happening. Um, Florida is really a go-to state because the taxes in blue states like New York and Massachusetts oh. and California. I know. I may have to move there, Chris. I cannot take the onerous taxes of Jerry Brown anymore. Well, and the new tax bill is going to penalize people in blue states that make high income. I know that. My 14% is not going to be deductible anymore for my federal. And people are so. here, so it's a great time. And Donald Trump, now in the past, um, Donald Trump, as a private citizen, would come to Florida to his mansion, Mar-a-Lago, which is a, a private club, uh, every weekend in the winter, practically, and he would golf, and he would see people in business and private life, and he would have Melania, typically, his family, uh, Eric and Don Jr., and, and Ivanka would be down here with Jared. So um, it was an area, an opportunity for them to get together and visit with friends and family. Um, I think the president would love to be down here a lot more often. He's been down here as a as a winter White House. Um, Mar-a-Lago was originally given by Mr. to build the house as a winter White House. You know, they criticized the president for coming here, but other presidents have taken. Ronald Reagan spent one whole year of his presidency out at the ranch in Santa Barbara. John mm. Kennedy every weekend in the summer would travel to Hyannis Port as president and many, many times to Palm Beach. Um, 
So it's not that unusual, and particularly if the economy is doing well and the country's in good hands, I think the president, more vacations are better. Well, I'm not going to argue that. I'm a man who's taking a vacation starting Thursday. As a matter of fact, I'm probably going to see you Christmas Eve over a buffet. Isn't that true? We are getting together. Yes, I believe we're. And you're. And is Teddy coming? Only if he's invited. Do they let four-legged guests in? I think you'd have to sign the guest book, and he he could do a poor print, couldn't he? I don't know if the Secret Service will permit him in because he has real shaggy long hair. He looks like a hippie. Oh, you're right. The Secret Service. Do we, does Teddy have a social security number? <laughs> yes, it's one t e d d y dot com. He has a website. Well, you and Janet and everyone's invited. We're going to have a great time. It's a great time. Of- how, how is the buffet? Is it still as good as ever down there at Mar-a-Lago? Well, everything Donald Trump does, he does exceptionally well. You know, Chris, you want to hear something funny before you go? The first time I went to Mar-a-Lago, I know, 10 years ago, I had a, I went to a buffet, and I noticed how good the lettuce was. This was long before Donald was even thinking of the presidency. And he came in, and I said, Mr. Trump, i got to tell you, I can judge a club by the lettuce. I said, your lettuce is crisp. He said, I know, I select it myself. This man did pay attention to every detail of that club. That's a fact. Oh, he's very engaged, very hands-on. But he wants everything to be done right. And, you know, even we're seeing here in the White House that, you know, he was a private business guy. He's not a politician. He didn't really know a lot of political people. Um, Over time, he's bringing in better and better people. The administration is running more smoothly. I think this tax bill was a huge turning point for him. I think short term is going to have some negative political consequences this year. But long term, it's going to take probably two years for the impact of of some of the tax benefits to hit. And there I know I'm going to I know I'm going to be paying more so I'm not happy, but overall maybe the middle class will be happy. Well, Chris, I really appreciate your time on the Savage Nation today and I do look forward to seeing you for Christmas Eve in Florida. Maybe we'll get a chance to uh, share some uh, iceberg lettuce together. And tomorrow we have Sean Spicer on Newsmax TV. So tune in you go to NewsmaxTV.com to find us or call your cable operator and tell them you, wanna, you want Newsmax TV on your cable system. Chris, who's going to be at the table with us when we're eating? Oh, it's a confidential private list, but it was cleared by the CIA. Okay. And, um, the <laughs> you can tell the president that I cut my ponytail. He doesn't have to be embarrassed this year. Well, he... he he thinks you're extraordinary and always goes out of his way to praise you. I hope you're telling me the truth. I wouldn't expect otherwise. Well, you um, the first national radio host to support him. You remember that? Yeah. Yep, well, that's true. And he he knows that. You know, Chris, when I was with you last year, I remember running up to him. I did. And I went up and I said, Mr. Trump, I'm Michael Savage. He put his arm around me and he said, I wouldn't be president without this guy. He announced at Mar-a-Lago. That was the greatest moment of my life, i got to tell you. Well, and it's a true story. I was there. You were there thanks to you. I embarrassed you by jumping up. Lucky I didn't get beaten up by the Secret Service. Well, he's, uh, I think, doing a remarkable job, and I think we're going to see things like not only is this economy going to roar in the next few years, but also I think he's dealing with things like Korea, which every president for years oh. has been ignoring. So I think we need to, you know, focus on supporting him in the things that he's doing and uh, as best we can and what we should do as two queens boys chris is make sure at night we go out with night vision to look for korean subs offshore when i'm down there in florida with you chris ruddy of newsmax tv newsmax.com a pleasure i will look forward to seeing you christmas eve in florida thank you very much for being with us same here my savage nation man i know a very long time Long, long time. You know what they say? They don't make new old friends. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com.
lighten up. It's holiday time out there in the Savage Nation. Even old Doc Savage needs a break every once in a while. I know many of you are freaked out that I'm going to be away starting Thursday for the whole holiday. I've never taken a vacation of this length, but I, I've decided at the end of 2017, I'm just doing it. I'm just uh, kicking back. Pow, Hannah, goodbye. Of course, I will occasionally call in just to say hello to my fill-in hosts, keep them in line. No, they're great guys. And I may appear once in a while on Periscope. That's a, an, a, I guess it's an app of its own on Twitter. If there's any huge breaking news, and I hope there isn't, I reserve the right to come back to the show intermittently. I know that nobody wants me to, but I may. Here is an interesting, crazy story. Columbia frat bro posts flyers looking for a formal date and lands a model. Okay. So he's a 28-year-old junior. He needed a date for his frat's winter for formal. He's a former Army, Army Ranger, but he wasn't dating anybody because he studies hard. So he takes a picture, he puts it up there, and he describes himself as a photogenic date, and he describes himself as, quote, slightly endowed with a big heart, and, <laughs> and PTSD-free, offering a complimentary Uber ride home and lists his Instagram handle. Slightly endowed with a big heart. That's an interesting statement. Most men, you know, would never... Struggling mode, blah, blah, blah. So he got a date with this girl who thought it was cute, and there it was. I guess they're going to get married now. You know, it's life ends well for him, I suppose, until who knows. Oh, it's a one-day thing. After a round of drink, the couple hopped into a party bus, blah, blah, blah. Okay, and this is nothing story, but these things go on, office parties, meeting people. I'm surprised people can still date in this day, day and age without wondering that they're going to go to, to go to jail. Let's go back to the other topics, if you want, which is confessions of housekeepers and valets to the rich. And what's the most uh, annoying word or phrase to you? I haven't done that yet. There's a new poll on that. The most annoying phrase or word, according to the new poll, is the word whatever. That's a way of insulting someone. If someone says something, you say whatever. That is considered a real pain in the neck. What whatever. What's the most annoying word or phrase to you? Fake news is one of them. Literally is another one. You know what I mean is the most agitating. And it seems to be broken down by age bracket. Whatever. Whatever. I'll be back. Whatever. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. So you gave him your heart too. Your heart too. Just as I gave mine yeah. to you. I love this guy. Little so pieces. And now, how do you do? It is 34 minutes after the hour. You listen to one and only Savage Nation. 24 years on the radio on March 24th of 2018. I hope to be here with you. Only four shopping days left to purchase God, Faith, and Reason. For Christmas, put God under that tree. That was nice. That sounded good. Very, very mellifluous. I like that. Drug and alcohol deaths at U.S. workplaces soar. Deaths jumped more than 30% in 2016. As the struggle with the deadly opioid epidemic migrates to the workplace. No kidding. How many people around you are stoned? Huh? Maybe everybody? Maybe, maybe, I, who's not stoned in this country? Everyone's on something. Whole country's drugged. I guess. Can't be. Our pilots can't be stoned. Let's see which professions can't be stoned. Pilots can't be, more or less. They're about the only profession I would say can't be. They're drug tested. I still think Congress should be drug tested. I think that everyone in Congress should pee in a cup at least once a month. And the results should be published on a, on a uh, I don't know, a website. Because I'm convinced most of them are whacked out of their minds by what they do, the things they say. We don't have to go down the list. You know, most of them are crazy, on, crazed out on drugs. Number of U.S. deaths at work from unintentional drug and alcohol overdose jump more than that's pretty sad. 217 workers died on the job last year as a result of an unintentional overdose from the non-medical use of drugs or alcohol. I don't know about you. I hate the smell of marijuana. I hate it. I despise it. I can't stand walking in the streets of San Francisco and getting, you know, like a whiff in my face from some drug addict in the gutter. Don't tell me they're not drug addicts. What do you think they're smoking it for everywhere? Because they're drug addicts. Marijuana is one of the most addictive of all drugs. 
Now take it from someone who smoked this garbage from the time I was 17 for a number of years. And I hated it, but I was addicted to it. And it was something I had to do because my friends did it. I'm a highly strung, highly intelligent man. It never worked for me. The friends who liked it the most were generally stupid. Low IQ people for whom the sense of creativity, the rush, was a new experience. But if you're a highly creative individual, marijuana will destroy your creativity. You may think the opposite is true, but it's not true. Ask any fine artist. You lose your ability to focus, and uh, you, you wind up like a baby staring at your own toenail, thinking that that's something significant. Or look at your own handwriting on the marijuana. Just test it for yourself. Just, I, I have a very fine handwriting ability. I write very beautiful script, cursive writing. And if I look back at my journals from 1969, 1970, 71, and I would smoke, let's say, hashish at the time, you know, I'd start doing, like, drawings and really bad stuff all over the journal page. And it made no sense. Long, uh, you know, stupid poetry of the kind you'd find in North Beach, California, uh, which they think is Nobel Prize level. And actually, in this day and age, it may be Nobel Prize level. So I'm, I'm a total anti-marijuana person. Which is not to say that there are not components of cannabis sativa that are not medicinally useful. There are. I'm a phytochemist, for God's sakes. But please don't tell me that getting high is good for you, because it isn't. And that's all I want to say on the issue. I'll give you an example of something that you could do without smoking marijuana. I, I know it's a trivial, stupid thing, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm a clock nut, and I, I have a lot of clocks in my houses. I'm, I'm obsessed with clocks. Because me and time, you know, it's like tick-tock, the hourglass thing. I've always been very cognizant of time. Ever since I've been a little boy, I've always liked clocks. I've always been aware of time. I knew that time waits for no man. I knew that you had to make your mark on life very early on, or nobody would remember you and know you. So I've been struggling since I'm young to make my mark in time. And I did so primarily with my writing, then with my broadcasting, and my record will be whatever it may be. After many books and many broadcasts, I have an archive that will have to be judged by others, not by you. So one of the things I like to do is, is as I say, is I like antique clocks, but I have cheap clocks as well. Like, a, you know, these little uh, battery-operated clocks? Everyone has them. Little battery, right? I have some that I love, and, and the thing dies after a number of years, and not because the battery ran out, but the movement, the little electric movement that cost a few dollars died like a person's heart. So for years, I wouldn't throw some of these clocks out because they were gorgeous. I'm looking at one right now. It's a cheap one. I bought, I swear to God, this clock for $4 at a garage sale. I know you're saying, what? You really did that? Yes. It has little food items around the side, like each food item, like a carrot is number one, is our one. An apple is our two. You know, a tangerine is our three. It stopped working three years ago, but I couldn't bring myself to trash it. So I kept it, you know, I don't know, a room somewhere. Then finally, about two weeks ago, I went, I went on the internet. And I said, how do you fix a battery-powered clock? And little did I know, there's guys out there who sell, like, the parts with a new movement for, like, 7 or $8. So I got the old nose plier out. I can't say it was easy removing the old movement. It was a challenge for me. And I'm a guy who used to build models as a kid. I was a model plane builder. I'd sit for hours and hours alone building model airplanes i built some out of balsa wood with paper and i was good at it and today they probably say the child's sick if he builds model airplanes if he's not playing with himself or ingesting some drug uh, you better take your child in for therapy but i don't know i i built model airplanes and i used to enjoy painting them putting the decals on so i'm very good at concentrating i love to sit at a desk with nobody around with a really good light on an arm, like an arm light. I like the old arm lights that I could focus with a good pair of magnifying glasses and do things. So I fixed the clock and it's running. Put the movement in this morning and it's now a quarter to the carrot. It's about eight, that's about 18, it's 18 minutes to the carrot right now. What time is it? 40? Yeah, about, no, about 20 minutes to the carrot. <laughs> And I got a kick out of that one. I think tonight I'm going to fix the nautical clock, which looks like the inside of a ship's uh, porthole. I didn't want to throw it. I was very expensive, but it stopped working, and I thought I had to throw the thing out. 
But I didn't. I fixed it. I'm not the only one who buys this stuff. There are whole businesses of this thing. The minute hand, the hour hand, the, the, uh, you know, it's interesting. There are people who, who do this stuff. I don't know why I'm telling you. This is just fun. It's one of my little craft hobbies. Don't you think people need these things in their life to, uh, does it give you life meaning? I don't know if it gives me meaning. It gives me focus away from something other than the horrors of the world or some moron lifting her skirt on Sunset Boulevard who can't get any attention. So she falls down and her skirt goes over her head and the New York Post finds a picture of her. That's what passes for news today. I'm tired of the news, you know, after a while. It's just enough for it. I'm saturated. Think of what I did this year. I published Trump's War. I made it number one without any publicity other than the Drudge Report and a few other sites. Number one, huge accomplishment. And then God, Faith, and Reason, which is a book actually I've been working on for 20 years. It's a sort of a collection of pieces that became very cohesive in the writing of it. That was number 11 on the New York Times list, again, with zero publicity and a headwind like you can't believe, a headwind against God. Nobody in the media wants to say God. They're afraid they'll be driven out of the uh, marketplace. Well, somehow it made it. Daily Show, and there it is. That's the year 2017. So I'm still trying to make a mark in my mark in time. It explains why I keep working. What is the point of stopping working? There's nothing out there. And it's just like an empty space, frankly. I remember writing a poem. I don't get into waxy stuff. Should I do this now? I don't know, maybe I'll do it. I'll go get an old journal maybe after the break and let you peek into the Michael of 1966 when I went to Europe to become a great writer. And, of course, I became a great nothing. And I had to come back to New York City and become a great social worker, which changed my whole worker, which changed my whole life when I saw how people were ripping off the welfare system and they were living better than I was. I mean, now you talk about a turning point. Here I was, a young college graduate with a real degree, making less money than some of the welfare cheats I had to take care of on the Upper West Side. See, the Upper West Side of Manhattan was once gorgeous and elegant, it fell into disrepair, Panic and Needle Park and all those years. And those beautiful buildings on Riverside Drive and whatnot were just welfare hovels. And I, as a young welfare social worker, used to have to go in there, knock on the door, welfare! You know, and I'd go in, and I guess my job was to inspect, so they hated me. I remember coming into apartments. They weren't supposed to have telephones, and apparently if they were getting you know benefits for a single woman, I'd see a pair of man's shoes on the floor, and I'd say, uh, I wouldn't say anything, actually. I was afraid they'd kill me. I remember once a phone rang, and when she wasn't supposed to have a phone, she was supposed to be poor. I said, um, ma'am, your, your bed is ringing. Would you please answer your bed? Could you please pick up the pillow? I mean, even then I had a little sarcastic sense of humor. But I woke up when my supervisor at the New York City Department of Welfare, which is what they called it then, then they had to change it late, the uh, late 70s, late 60s, from the New York uh, Department of Welfare to some, who they call social services. Social service, a welfare department. I remember coming home to my rented apartment in Queens, in Colden Street, if I remember. I had no furniture. I couldn't afford it. I had a mattress on the floor, and I had orange crates for, for like, uh, lamp tables. I go to work the next day, and was, I had a new welfare client, they call him, client, on the Upper West Side. And so she said to me, okay, write down $250 for a sofa. $125 for two side tables, a hundred and a quarter for the bed, two lamps. I said, wait a minute. I don't have those things that I'm a, uh, I'm a college graduate. She said, well, a civilized person must have a sofa, two uh, tables, an armchair, a coffee table, a bed. I said, but I'm civilized and I can't afford it. She said, well, I'm sorry. That's the way the system is. That's when I awakened to the fact that we were living in a welfare state. That was the beginning of the education of the young Michael Savage. And that's how I became a realist in my politics. It wasn't through a textbook. It was from Real Life 101. Back in a minute. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com.
Welcome back to the Savage Nation. I want to talk about energy for a minute because we all want more energy, right? Well, unfortunately, fatigue often gets in the way. Everyone feels it, even for everyday activities. And it seems to get worse every year. And here's why when you're 20, your body has a natural ability to maintain healthy circulation. But by age 40, that ability decreases by 50%, and that leaves you feeling what? Tired. So you can do something to increase that youthful natural circulation and fight fatigue. And that's why I recommend you drink Super Beats. Super Beats promotes the body's own natural ability to produce healthier circulation. For increased energy and stamina all day long, only Super Beats is made from beets grown to exacting standards and then concentrated into superfood crystals. So listen to me. If you want to increase your own natural energy, you call 1-800-481-0504. Or please go to SavageLovesBeats.com. That's SavageLovesBeats.com. With your first order, you're going to get another 30-day supply of Super Beats free and indicator strips to see if it's working, and it does. And you're going to get free shipping. Call 800-481-0504 or go to SavageLovesBeats.com. Okay, Will, on WBOB in Jacksonville, one of my favorite cities on earth. What's on your mind, Will? So you were talking about uh, phrases or words that you don't want to hear. For me, it's and not to mention or needless to say. Every time it <laughs> starts with those, I... You know, you know what I like? Listen to talk shows to say, to, to be perfectly honest. How many of them say, to be perfectly honest? What does that mean? They're not honest most of the time? Yeah, I had somebody saying that to me today, and I'm just, why do I want to listen to you if you have to say it? Yeah, or, or how about someone who says to you, uh, to tell you the truth, what do you mean, most of the time you don't? You think that way. So for the ninth consecutive year, Americans say whatever is the most annoying word or phrase used according to a Marist poll. Other, other words or phrases that uh, people uh, are object to are fake news, no offense but, the word literally, and you know what I mean. You don't like needless to say and not to mention, correct? That's correct, sir. I hate to hear those. Well, not to mention the fact that God, faith, and reason is on the way to you. I will mention it, so stay on the line. 855-407-282 is the phone number. We're talking about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, I guess. <laughs> when you think about it, we are talking about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, aren't we, in our own little way? In our own little way. No one called yet to uh, give us the insight on being a housekeeper and a valet to the rich and famous. And our prominent Upper East Side couple is, is offering two people 150000 bucks a year to cook, clean, and run errands for them. What a list of things they have to do. Wow, I would never take that job. And a Johns Hopkins psychiatrist, top of his field, says transgender is a mental disorder and sex change is biologically impossible. I guess he won't be allowed on MSNBC, <coughs> who believe everything that's crackpot is true and everything that's true is false and that up is down and that there's collusion. There's collusion between Trump and Russia for sure to those on MSNBC, but no collusion between those on MSNBC and lies. No collusion whatsoever. Middle class to get 23% of tax cuts for individuals on the GOP bill. North Korea. Whatever happened to North Korea? Four weeks ago we were at war with them. Now it's gone. How did that war end? I thought we were going to, you know, any day Guam or Hawaii were going to disappear. I, you know, how did it go away so fast? When he came to his senses, Kim Jong mentally ill and I don't know. KLIF, Dallas, Texas, line four. You are up, Mike, in Dallas. What's on your mind? Hello, Dr. Savage. Uh, one of the words that bug me a lot is uh, nuclear. Yeah, oh, that's, that's, that's George. That was Bush. Nuclear. Yeah, and five-star generals, for crying out loud, cannot pronounce. <laughs> How do you say nu nuclear? Nuclear. Why can't they say nuclear? Why is that a hard word? I don't know. That's the way it's spelled. <laughs> How could a president of the United States have said nuclear? Nuclear no. for years. Yeah, I agree. That You know, I, I can understand, you know, a few average common folks. But when it comes from five-star generals and the commander-in-chief, that well, that, no, come on now. Donald Trump never said nuclear. He could say nuclear. I mean, it was George Bush who said nuclear. Oh, I've heard nuclear even from scientists on, uh, you know, on, on uh, science. Well, I don't know why that is. That's an interesting thing. Why do people say that? Well, I'm going to send you, um, there's only four shopping days till Christmas, and I don't know if you've done it yet, but I'm sending you God, faith, and reason to put under that tree to put God back in Christmas. House forced to revote on tax cuts, no Dems, Senate tonight.
Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. December 19th, 2017. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of borders, language, culture, and here he is, winner of the National Radio Hall of Fame Award, Michael Savage. We have so much to be thankful for in this country. I wish you people knew how good we are. Have it. Even if we're poor, we're living better than most kings lived in most of the world through the centuries. How they got such hatred for the nation is not beyond me. I know how it happened. The minds were poisoned by the media moguls who live off dissent and hatred. So today we move into hour three. We're talking about new topics. So I'm going to give you another peek behind the curtain. In the last hour, I told you it was a quarter to the carrot. For those of you who are following the show, you know what I was meaning by that. It's actually a qu- it was a quarter to the eggplant. The second hour is the eggplant in that little clock I fixed. Uh, the carrot is hour number three, but I'll tell you more about that later. I may actually put it up on Facebook and Twitter, a picture of my vegetable clock that I fixed this morning in order to uh, just have some fun focusing on fixing clocks by getting a new electric movement for seven ninety nine and say, saving something that would have been thrown in the garbage. I'm a guy who saves things. I like old things. I guess you could say I'm an antiquarian in that regard. The preservation of things in the past is a very important part of our present, especially in a throwaway society where people don't even know how to save a pair of shoes. I remember a guy called me last week who said he's from Italian family, New York, grandfather was a shoemaker. Remember that call? He said if he'd go visit his grandparents, they would look at his shoes. If they needed soles, the grandfather would literally take his shoes and put a pair of soles on them in the house at a dinner. It was amazing to listen to that story. What a different time it really was. So I'm going to give you a little, a little peek behind the screen for a moment, a moment before I go back to those topics or bring up some new ones. I'm in different broadcast studios generally, but there's one I like the most. It's where I spend most of my time, and it was out of action for six weeks. The uh, telephone lines, meaning the ISDN lines, were not working. Then there were the fires up in Sonoma, Napa, and we couldn't get AT&T out here. It's all fixed, and they're running like for a week, and I love it. I never want to leave this place. I'm very content here. The dog is sleeping under the desk. Little old Teddy's down there. And it's where I feel most comfortable. So I have objects in every studio. If I ever could collect all the objects I have from all my different studios and put them in one place, it would be a virtual savage museum. But in this particular studio, I'm going to read you the titles of the books that I keep right next to my broadcast desk. You ready? The Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament, with five, two, three hundred post-its in it. Uh, I'm not saying I'm religious particularly, but I also have the daily prayer book with a lot of post-its in it. Nine and a Half Mystics, The Kabbalah Today by Herbert Wiener, The True Believer by Eric Hoffer, A Pocket History of the World, Plato's Republic, I'm just I'm pulling the books out at random, The Teaching of Buddha, The Doors of Perception in Heaven and Hell by Aldous Huxley, The New Pocket, Roger's Thes- 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 Ugh, Thesaurus, <laughs> sorry, uh, 30 Days to a More Powerful Vocabulary, something we had to read in high school in my day. It seems now that the morons who are prominent in the media try to spend 30 days to a less powerful vocabulary trying to say the F word in as many conjugations as they, ha- as they can to get a better role in, in a record company. Then there's the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the Latin and English Dictionary. That's a great one. And the Spanish-English-English-Spanish Dictionary. And here's one I really love. I don't use it much. The Concise Etymological Dictionary of the English Language by Skeet. Oxford University Press. I've had that for years. When you look up the derivation of words, I always like root 
roots of words. We don't realize that words are so powerful. Words can heal. Words can kill. Words can really hurt, can't they? Think about the people who have hurt you with a single word. Or one word. One word can keep a person from hurting themselves, steering them in the right direction. It's amazing how plastic our minds and souls really are. And that leads us almost back to all the questions of the day, which is the use of uh, marijuana, the overuse of marijuana, how people are starting to think it's a health food. They don't understand that it's a drug like so many others. Don't argue with me and say it's better than alcohol. That, that's not the point. I'm not arguing for you to go out and get a drink. That's like an absurd argument to say it's better than alcohol for you. Well, that's not the point. I'm not telling you to just use alcohol. That's not my point. I'm warning you about the dangers. You're all in love with marijuana now. You're in love with it. Love with it. You have any idea how you're being brainwashed into thinking it's good for what it ails you? What a Nostra marijuana has become? How many people are stoned on this garbage all day long? But I don't even want to talk about it anymore. You want to ruin your mind, go ahead. What do I care what you do with your brain? 855 uh, 407 Here's a little legal story. You know how much I love lawyers. Trustee ready to distribute $584 million to Madoff customers. The liquidation trustee for Bernie Madoff's failed securities firm told a New York federal bankruptcy court Monday that he's ready to distribute more than $584 million to investors who fell victim to Madoff's Ponzi scheme, bringing the total amount that will have been paid out so far to about $11.4 billion. I wonder what the lawyer made on it. <laughs> How come they always make out like bandits answer? <laughs> because they are bandits. And they make out like bandits. That's all. Trust the So $584 million. How much did he get? Mr. Picard. Irving Picard. Securities Investor Protection Act trustee Irving Picard asked the bankruptcy court for approval of the payout. Oh, look, someone had to do it, so his firm made a fortune off doing it, but the others are getting some money back here and there. I never invested with Bernie Madoff. I never had access to him, nor did I want it, nor would I would have trusted a sleazebag like him. I could read him from a mile away. I don't know how people fell for it. I don't understand it. Can't you tell con men when you meet them? Don't you have an inherent ability to read con men? Madoff stank to high heaven of a con man. There are so many giveaways, it's unbelievable to me. What, are people were that naive? They, they'd kill themselves. And the more they say, no, no, the, the fund is closed. I'm, that's the first giveaway. Is when the guy who owns the fund says, I'm sorry, you can't get in. You know you're in. You know you're going to get fleeced. You know, that's because everybody wants to join an exclusive club that they're locked out of. So, shall I give you other tips? Not really. I'm not in the mood. I'll take some calls. 855-407-282 is the phone number. We were talking about the most annoying words of phrases, including whatever. Why the GOP tax plan to repatriate offshore profits may flop. CBS News covered that. And uh, they refer back to a one-time tax holiday on overseas profits 13 years ago in the 2004 American Jobs Creation Act, which at the time temporarily cut taxes on repatriated profits to 5.25% from the former 35 percent so you say wow that must have boomed the economy well 9700 companies took advantage of the tax break and they brought back 312 billion dollars 15 companies led by Pfizer, Merck, Hewlett Packard accounted for 52 percent of the repatriated money but did it produce hiring no according to the study instead of expanding operations or hiring companies at the time tended to use the money to buy back shares of their own stock purchases that disproportionately benefit wealthy investors who are less likely to spend any extra income. It had almost no payoff to the economy, said Adam Looney, senior fellow in economics at the Brookings Institution. <laughs> A Senate subcommittee report concluded, in fact, that 10 of the 15 companies that repatriated the most money actually cut jobs after the tax holiday. Pfizer slashed 10,000 jobs in 05. And 06, Merck slash 7,000, and Hewlett Packard 14,500. So for those of you who are thinking, oh, great, all these big companies are going to bring back the money now because Trump's lowered the, the amount they're going to, you know, why don't you look at the history of this and understand that if this bill really had merit, they would have put teeth in it, which said we're going to lower the taxes to a very low amount so you can bring the money back. But the caveat is, 
you're signing a contract that says you must spend X percent of the money you bring back in job creation in America, but it's not in that bill. So, you know, it's like a little smoke and mirrors here for those of you who want to know the truth behind the statement, which is what I try to specialize in, which is the truth behind the statement rather than just the propaganda in front of the statement. Edward Kleinbard, professor at the University of Southern California's Gould School of Law, said, The experience from the 2004 tax holiday suggests that most of this money will be distributed to shareholders not invested in U.S. business assets. So, you know, believe who you want, but the results uh, can be studied in the past, and I suggest you look at the reality rather than the propaganda. This is The Savage Nation. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Sitting on the dock of the bay, watching the tide. It is 21 minutes after the eggplant on the Savage Nation. <laughs> it's going to become like a fun joke with me. Remember yesterday we talked about the train wreck, and there was an allegation that they, the um, Antifa people put concrete on the tracks, and that suddenly got dropped. Now it was, the engineer was speeding. I don't know what to believe. Which part of the, you know, who's lying about what? Do you actually think we would be told if it was terrorism? You know the government would sweep it under the rug. Any government wants to make themselves look impotent, I mean, I'm, um, all powerful and not impotent. So I don't know what to believe. But yesterday I talked about 4chan. I called them nonpartisan hackers who expose BS. And, uh, I don't know what they're saying about it now. They're calling me Uncle Mike on 4chan now. I like that. Anonymous is calling me Uncle Mike. Uncle Mike just mentioned it again. We nonpartisan hackers who expose BS now. Go hackers go. Um, there's so much in the news, I don't even want to do the news, to be honest. So I'm sitting here with the, uh, during the break, I picked up Skeet's Concise Etymological Dictionary of the English Language. I think I'm going to take it on, on vacation and read it on the beach. What if you found a guy sitting on a beach on an umbrella reading expiate, expire, explain, expletive, explicate, explicit, explode, exploit, explore, exponent, export, expose, exposition, expostulate, expound? Express, yes, ma'am, can I help you? Expulsion, expunge, expurgate, exquisite, extant, ecstasy, extend. Would you think the guy's weird for reading a etymological dictionary on the beach? <laughs> I think so. I don't actually read on the beach for two reasons. One, I never sit on the beach. And two, I don't read on the beach because I respect my eyesight and I really avoid the sun. But nevertheless, it's an interesting idea. For a character in a movie, I guarantee you some film writer is going to pick this one up and throw it in a script of some weird guy sitting and reading a dictionary on the beach. You talk about ADD, man. Wow. <laughs> uh, confessions of housekeepers and words that you find grating. What words do you find grating? Here we go. Jim on WLOB Radio. Jim, which word or phrase bothers you the most? At the end of the day. It's oh, <laughs> Me, you mean, in the middle of colloquial discussion, someone says, "Listen, Jim, at the end of the day, that kind of thing." <laughs> They'll say it two or three times in one conversation. And all they well, what about the people? What about the people in radio who say, to be perfectly honest, what to tell you the truth? It means what? They're lying most of the time. I think they're stalling for time. <laughs> they're stalling for time. You know, that's interesting. How do people stall for time? <laughs> how do they stall for time in radio? Or how do they ad lib in stalling for time? How about dead air? That's a big famous one. It's like simply dead air. 10, 15, 12. Count the dead air. How much dead air do you ever find in my show? Almost zero. Zero. I, compre I compress my thoughts or I, I wouldn't do the show. The day I have to use dead air or coughing to cover up blank spaces, I definitely would get off the radio. And I'll start reading dictionaries on the beach. Jim, I'm sending you a book. If you name the title, you get it. What's the title of my book? Past, Faith, and Reason. You got it, my friend. You're a prince. You're a prince of communi communications. A prince of communications. That's all. Wow. Should I read a four-year-old's view of God? No, we did that. Does God exist? That's your business. What do people do who don't believe in God and their suffering at the end of their life? Who do they turn to? I don't even know what they turn to. 
Do you know that I have a chapter in this book entitled Rabbi in a Brothel, a Fable? Oh, yes. There's some early writings in here. And I quote Leviticus on the side, Thou shalt not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Leviticus 19.18. So the character says, Either become a rabbi or open a brothel in Borneo. That's what my choices are. I had reached the ultimate cul-de-sac in my misbegotten existence. Staying on this road is decay, disease, and death. Straight ahead, I'd rather become a rabbi or open a brothel. She said to him, both would be closer to God than your life. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very interesting fable in God, Faith, and Reason that you would never expect to be in such a book. This is not a goody-two-shoes book. This is not what you'd expect. It's not an evangelist's book. Let me see if there's anything funny in here that I can read to you. Nah, I don't think so. It's for you to read. Go to a bookstore and read it. You'll see what I'm talking about. It's filled with stories, interesting stories. How about a... I want to read a page. I do want to read a page. Oh, this is when I was going through the atheistic phase. And I had my character say this, which is why the original book of the Jews was now read only by illiterate fools who by circumstance or genetic dysfunction believed the words had been dictated from heaven and inscribed in stone. Probably a collection of constipated poets, failed jewel hustlers, bankrupt sandal makers, whoremongers past their prime, child molesters, animal torturers, and other biblical age riffraff thought the bridge drivers he now approached the South Tower nearing the toll booths into the city. I had one of my characters say that. Come on, you got to admit it's funny. It's, it's, it's cynicism. I had a toll booth taker say that as a character. In, on page 223, two, would you ever expect that in God, Faith, and Reason? You hear a book like this, oh, God, Faith, and Reason, you think of me like a preachy, sensitive, evangelical kind of preachy book. From It isn't. It's one man's whatever. One man's odyssey. I just used it, you see. I wanted to grate you. Dude, I just wanted to grate you. I just wanted to grate you. Uh, which is why the original book of the... I don't mean that, by the way. That's my character. I want to speak about religion for a minute. You know, I'm not a particularly organized religion guy. I so respect people who are, though. I don't want you to get the wrong. I want you to get the wrong impression of me. If it were not for the people who were orthodox in their religion, there would be no religion at all. They are the ones who keep the entire traditions alive, whether it be Christian or Jewish. So we have to respect them, even though we are not them. They keep it alive. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. With the impulses, with the impulses of a not-so-ordinary man, and the personality of a born tyrant, our bridge traveler to nowhere had no intention of spending his life dressed in black. He was hurt by God, so he will become a priest, was a saying he'd grow up on. But could he not climb a tree so high and see so far as to bring back to earth for all to see God's vision for a perfect south? Could he not somehow fulfill his brother's lost lot in other than a formal priestly way by rescuing healing plants, for example? Oh, how impossible this quest of the alternate priest became to prove to God, if not to man, that you worshipped him, but in your own way to do so without edifice or pageant, to sing his praises in silence, to bow down to him without moving, to follow his commandments without following them, had our running priest become a Buddhist. A horn warned the fog. A ship slipped the gate. Images of Bob and his generation looking forward to the shore crossed his mind. I'm on a bus going to Fort Cronkite. It comes to the end of the line. The driver says, everybody off the bus. I sit still. Okay, okay, off the bus. I ain't getting off, I tell him. It's too windy on the beach. For June in San Francisco, we're having August weather, but worse. The product of Saddam's oil fires last year vectors the wind out of control. The Muslim winds again. For just a hundred years, remember, in just a hundred years, our cunning Arab cousins took an unknown local cult of the book and swept two-thirds of the world. He gets out of his driver's seat. He comes to the back of the bus where I'm sitting next to two old ladies. And he says, look, he says, you've got to get off the bus. I ain't going. He's got a half-shaved head, an earring, three rings on each finger, and he's a bus driver. One word leads to another. Listen, I'm going to smoke, and you've got to get off the bus. 
All I told him, it's illegal. Get off the bus and smoke with the rest of the numbskulls. I'm not getting off in this wind. Wind, Hasim, screws everybody's mind, ions, pollen, mites, viroids into people's minds, sweeps protective cullens from the skin, upraises particles unseen, stripping people. Wind, wind is death, according to the Japanese. Wind, the Russians think it brings illness, as do the Chinese. Not a race on earth welcomes it, yet wind is the great pollinator without which all screws itself. Wind, the world itself upsets. So Bob stays on the bus with the two old ladies, one asking the other, what did he say? Not comprehending the bus driver or seeing his earring or shaved head or attitude, the hostile driver smokes a cigarette. I'm reading from Rabbi in a Brothel, which is a fable inside God, Faith, and Reason, the most unexpected piece of the book, which I thought I would treat you with right now. And a little bit more, so you get a little uh, taste of what's in here. Could the warnings and exhortations of Job compare with Disney? Could Jeremiah compete with the evening news? Look what the New York Times had become. One power-mad psychopath after another paraded throughout, with all the details of his or her personal wealth displayed, so as to render the moderately successful reader impotent and hopeless by the time the sports page was reached. Could this epic of the Sulzbergers be compared with Ecclesiastes? No, of course not. Which is why the original book of the Jews was now read only by illiterate fools, who by circumstance or genetic dysfunction, believed the words had been dictated from heaven and inscribed in stone, probably a collection of constipated poets, failed jewel hustlers, bankrupt sandal makers, whoremongers past their prime, child molesters, animal torturers, and other biblical age riffraff, thought the bridge driver as he now approached the south tower of the Golden Gate Bridge near the toll booths of the city. He glanced at the tiny fortune cookie fortune scotch tape to the dashboard of his old two-door Bronco, you are an angel. Beware of those who collect feathers. <laughs> Come on, the writing is good. You know, give me a break here. No one can write like this in this country. By now, it's a private comedy. I'm no angel, but I've lost most of my feathers, mostly trying to fly, he mused. Every time I've been given a chance, I could soar like an eagle. It's been the trying to fly where the real losers live. Those failed writers who became agents, now all menopausal and ready to give to the UJA after years supporting the PLO. Those tight-lipped wasp academics whose guilt made them hire the Jews after the Holocaust. The academic Jews who chose to exile any hint of rebellion in their Jewish male descendants, welcoming instead the women and other minorities they thought they could bamboozle. And the bamboozle they did, and bamboozle they did, running every racket in the universities known to the mafia within the halls of academe, encouraging all the while the debate over affirmative action so they could continue their plunder plundering unnecessary research funds, conducting excessive animal experimentation, molesting the young students, holding grandiose conferences modeled on the tools of those government bureaucrats they did business with. The look what the universities have become, he thought, plunderer of graduate students' discoveries and labor, plunderer of all lost ideals everywhere and in all time since Abraham tried to slay Isaac, but was saved by a counter-hallucination. A generation of incompetence not seen in the history of the Republic. Incompetence who had created their own fields of study to justify their lack of productive scholarship in the real fields of learning. Those fertile fields which blossomed with a flora so vibrant and diverse, now reduced in size and offering to almost nothingness. Leo Tolstoy wrote somewhere that those who believe their religion is greater than God will believe that their sect is greater than their religion and, up, and end up by believing that they are greater than their sect. On and on it went as he drove over the Golden Gate Bridge. See, I began as a writer, so you're going to get a little bit of the writer in here, not the uh, polemicist. Now, my favorite piece of God, Faith, and Reason, for those of you who don't want to buy the book, for whatever the reason is, maybe you don't have the money or you don't, whatever, I'm going to give it to you for free. It's my Christmas holiday. I have a few minutes now to read you the favorite last pages of the book about a funeral. An old guy who uh, is dying, and I, I didn't know them that well. And uh, then the guy is, here we go. I'm speaking to, uh, in this case, the character is speaking to a guy who he knew who was a bit of a Nazi. But he and the Nazi got along. They argued all the time, but they got along. He wasn't a hateful Nazi. He was just a Nazi by inclination. And he respects people who are real for what they are because at least he can talk to them. They don't hide who they are. And he had saved this Nazi from uh, cancer by taking him out of the VA hospital and uh, putting him on... Uh, the Linus Pauling vitamin C program, and he was cured. He pulled him back from the diagnosis of lymphoma. So he goes and visits this guy in an SRO hotel in San Francisco, the character does, and he says, 
His name is Bob, the Nazi. He says, Bob, I went to a funeral last week for my friend Joel's father. You want to hear about it? I almost called you to come. They didn't have too many friends. Bob nodded, sipped on his beer, and settled back to listen. One thing about his generation and his culture, they were good listeners. Joel's father, Murray, was 82, I began. He survived Auschwitz, where the German bastards cut three fingers from his right hand with a saw just for sport. I watched Bob's face. It was, as I expected, guarded. After all, I had met him in a bar about 12 years before when I had stood up to his anti-Semitic ravings. We c quickly became good but guarded pals, he needing his Jew and I my goy. Though he stood over six feet five and was made of lean English muscle, I had threatened to kill him if he didn't shut up. Now, I'm only five foot seven, but I'm broad enough and my eyes relay protons of dark danger. I've been mistaken for an Italian in Italy, a Spaniard in Spain, an Arab in Morocco, a Jew in Brooklyn. The reason I say I've been mistaken for a Jew is because I don't believe like, I don't behave like one, at least those I know here in America. Maybe I was born to lead a tank brigade in Israel or a mob in Vegas. All I know is that I've led Little League in the suburbs and a few expeditions to collect plants in the Fiji Islands and been damn proud of it. But my eyes are those of a saint when calm, a killer when agitated. It's in my blood, I think, this murderous rage. Either through eye power or the work of saving angels, I've talked my way out of death more than once. So Bob shut his mouth that night many years ago, and as I've said, he tends to harbor certain Nazi sentiments. So when I told him about Murray's mutilated hand, I wasn't surprised at his lack of immediate pitying sounds, but I like a challenge, so I went on. Murray never cried about his hand, I told Bob. He came to America with Florence, who he met somewhere over there, and had a family, namely Joel. He was full of life, this Murray. He was a big drinker, he loved women, he beat his son with a strap, but he was a big personality. Bob nodded. I think the anti-Semite the anti -Semite in him liked the never cried and beat his son parts of Murray, so I proceeded with my funeral story. I had lost touch with Joel for a few years. His wife threw him out for beating her and at least one of their daughters, and he was in one of his episodic hidings this time from the sheriff's department. They were after him for his house and all his earnings to give to his greedy wife. Somehow I heard his father Murray had cancer and was dying. I called his mother and went over a few days later. We brought a bag of groceries, you know, French bread, a pound of sliced turkey, some wine, some vegetables, and a quart of milk. The usual stuff you bring when someone's sick, poor, and housebound. Florence and Joel greeted us at the door of their little one-bedroom apartment, their little one-bedroom apartment on Van Ness Avenue. I always liked it there. They were really nice people. They reminded me of my parents. Having been in the antiques business like my deceased father, Benny, the place was filled with oversized, high-quality furniture and paintings. Murray was in a bathrobe, in a gigantic English armchair, shrunken but beautiful in a way. He pulled me close and said, Michael, Michael, I remember when you took me and Joel over there to Berkeley 20 years ago. I know you almost 20 years holding tightly onto my hand. That's not a short time, Michael. You took me to a bar after on Telegraph. Those were the good times. Now are the bad. Bob, I prodded you hear this. I extend one good deed 20 years ago, and this guy remembers. It's like one of the best moments of his life. This one drink. So he goes fast into the hospital where he insists they let him out, probably to die at home. And three or four days later, boom, it's over like that. Joel told me he had been sick most of the night, <clears throat> vomiting, probably those toxic chemicals. He forces himself up and says, Joel, she's there on your left, the angel of death. Joel gets scared. He says, Pop, there's nobody here but me and, and me and Mom. Murray stares at the big chair across the small room. To your right, Joel, on the couch. He's here with her. He stands up, starts to walk across the room and collapses. I can see that even the anti-Semite Bob is tearing up, wiping the tears from his face. Listen, you racist bastard, I said to him, looking at that hole in the ground with Murray's casket so bare and hearing the rabbi's ancient chant and watching the young Mexican grave diggers moved by that chant, I became reminded of my own hole waiting. I never knew where I wanted to live, I whispered to Joel's friend from Israeli intelligence at the graveside, and I sure don't know where I want to die. He looked at me and said, we never know where we're going to die. He reminded me with the 70s, rockers, cackle, and grin. That's in God, Faith, and Reason. It was supposed to be the end of the book, but I changed it to another part of the book. This is Michael Savage. I'll be back in a minute. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by Swiss America, the only company I trust with my financial future. Call 800-289-2646 or SwissAmerica.com. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. Major League 
weird place right now. I got to tell you, I mean, my mind went so far away from this radio show and reading that to you because I wrote that so long ago. I had to get into that state of mind to write it. I wrote it a long time ago. And I'm not even here right now. My mind is there. I got to tell you, I'm in a, a complete different state. I don't even feel like going on with the show. Thank God it's almost over. It's like a quarter to the carrot. It'll, over, it'll be over soon. But I, mean, I remember that funeral. I didn't like it very much. Funerals aren't fun to begin with. But that guy had suffered so much on this earth. He had nothing in his life that was good. Nothing went right in his life. Just the end was as black as it gets. And there was no redemption. There was no redemption at, at that grave. Nothing. There was nothing. Zero. It was as empty as a vulture's heart. Karen, KVOR up in Colorado, line four. Go ahead, please. Did I hit the wrong button? Dr. I Savage, I'm so happy to be talking with you. I, I love that story, and especially that you created a highlight for that man, and you didn't even know it. It sort of guides us day by day. Oh, you mean that one kind mo thing of taking him for a drink 20 years before? One kind. One kind. It's function. very interesting how one kindness will last in a person's life when they have so little. And sometimes it lasts when they have so much. Well, no, no, it's a very interesting point, which is one good deed can, can last a lifetime and, and beyond. I guess that's what you're Remember, saying. Remember, shouldn't we? Well, I guess that's the point of my having included that, that uh, sentimental anecdote in God, Faith, and Reason. It was in a certain in a certain way I was saying one good deed I, I don't even know why I put it in I thought it fit but what I was saying was I suppose and you're making me understand it is that I'm saying one good deed can have a profound effect on another person's life it's like going to church for me when I hear that story but you know Karen how many of my listeners actually heard that story talk radio is not a medium for literature I don't even know if literature is possible in this world today I tend to think that the, the world of literature is dead, and the idea of literature is over completely. That unless it's so highly politicized, people aren't, aren't even going to read it. you got to remember, I wrote that piece of that book many years ago when it was unpub unpublishable. And the only reason it has seen the light of print in this best-selling book, God, Faith, and Reason, is because my publisher has had such success with me with my other books that she let me do whatever I thought needed to be done to make this book complete and so she said whatever you want to do it's your book and so i mean would a, would a publisher publish a piece of literature like that today i don't even know i don't even know if there's an audience for it is what i'm saying can an audience even receive poetry anymore i mean real poetry of the kind i just read on this on this program as opposed to the the drivel that passes for poetry today that i'm, I'm, I'm going to get off the phone here i don't want to spend spend too much time on this because if i do i'm going to get distracted myself um uh, you want me to take some calls now? I have a minute and 38 seconds less left. We've been talking about some weird topics today, political, spiritual, you know, financial. I read from God, Faith, and Reason. And I have avoided playing some of the great sound that we have. But maybe that will be done tomorrow, which is my last show until the end of the uh, year, until the beginning of the new year in January. And, uh I'm very much looking forward to it, as I said to uh, my guest earlier in the last hour. Uh, I'm hoping to uh, meet some interesting people over the weekend, including one that's very interesting to America and the world. And uh, the GOP tax plan to repatriate offshore profits. I explained to you this has been tried before, and this tax holiday was done in 2004 under the American Jobs Creation Act, and it yielded almost nothing. The only beneficiaries were the companies, which used it, the money to buy back shares of their own stock, and uh, the average person had no payoff. I expect the same thing to happen this time, because the only way it would ever be different is if Congress wrote in the bill that we're going to let you repatriate the money at almost no taxes, if... In writing, you agree to spend 90% of the money on building factories and creating jobs. That didn't happen. Only four shopping days left to purchase the literature called God, Faith, and Reason for Christmas. Put God back under the tree. Thank you and good night. Savage. Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel.